I'm Taylor Riggs in New York in for Emily Chang. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, we work it. The workspace company is poised to file its public prospectus for its IPO this week. We talk about how much WeWork is worth and what's at stake. Plus, election surprise. Argentina's primary results paint a picture of voters angry over the economy. But is an ongoing recession and soaring inflation spreading to a rather robust tech startup scene? We'll explore with an entrepreneur who's done business in Buenos Aires. An icon wields influence. Billionaire Carl Icon reaches an agreement with Cloudera, awarded two seats on the tech company's board. More on his influence as well as what he's agreed to. But first, let's get to our top story. Now, the theme of big tech is hitting the public market. It all continues in 2019. WeWork is planning to make public its prospectus for its IPO as early as this week. This would unveil the full financial picture of the office sharing startup for the first time. Now, the company said in April that it had filed paperwork for the initial public offering confidentially with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. To discuss all of this, we are joined by Barry Oxford of DA Davidson and Bloomberg Technologies, Ellen Hewitt. Thank you both for joining me. Ellen, I want to start quickly with you as we await the prospectus that could come out really at any day here. What are the key bullet points that you're looking for? I think everyone's going to be looking to see more details about the financial performance of WeWork. This is a company that has been highly scrutinized for its losses. Um, it's unprofitable, similar to some of its brethren like Uber and Lyft. It's a company that spends a lot of money to grow very quickly. And I think people are concerned that the business model isn't going to withstand a downturn. So people are certainly, certainly going to be looking for details to see if their theories about how WeWork will hold up are going to be held out in this prospectus. You know, Barry, we've talked about Ellen, and she talks about the financials and the numbers behind this company. What do you make of the valuation here? Some of our estimates show it at about $47 billion. What do you make of that? Sure. I think um, um, Ellen is, is spot on is that that is what most people will when we get the um, S1 is be kind of ripping through to kind of look at the numbers and, and figure out uh, the valuation at this particular point. The last valuation, the $47 billion, is based off of uh, SoftBank's investment of $2 billion back uh, in, in January. It, it's hard for me to emphatically say that that, it, that that is a high valuation, but it definitely feels high, and I think investors, uh, both real estate investors and technology investors, uh, given kind of the Uber, uh, will be uh, very scrutinizing any kind of uh, high uh, uh, high profile and high valuation IPO. We've given a lot of these growth and tech companies a pass on not being profitable. At what point do you want to start to see some profitability from this company? Sure. And, and, and you know, it, it's understandable that, look, if you've got a growing company that maybe they're going to run it in the red, you want to give them uh, that time to kind of grow uh, and really kind of create the market share that they need to create. And that's what WeWorks is, is trying to do. But at, at the same time, there's got to be a limit to you know how much you can run in the red before wait a second investors need to see um, so, some profit I, I would hope that w when I go through and look at the s1 and then try and model out and pro forma that within you know the next 12 to 18 months I would start to see some profitability Ellen let me bring you in here to comment on that one thing that really stood out to me in your story was top line is about 1.8 billion dollars but on the bottom line even negative they're spending and, and losing about 1.9 billion dollars a year according to their last annual financial statements that we have. At what point are investors getting, uh, you know, excited about a top line growth of 1.8 billion versus being nervous about how much they're losing on the bottom line? I think that's going to be the major divide between people who are looking to analyze this stock. Some people are going to look at it and think, you know, this company has incredible growth. They have a huge addressable market. You know, we're talking about real estate, um, commercial real estate just being one of the biggest financial opportunities in the world. And others are going to look at their spending and think, you know, I'm not sure that this is sustainable. And I think it might actually come down to more of a point of view than anything else. Certainly, WeWork holds its view that its growth is essential to the value of the company and that what it holds there is, is so valuable and so much different than what other real estate companies and commercial real estate providers might be able to provide. 
Ellen, who are their biggest competitors? They, ha you know, other co-working companies are trying to sort of follow in WeWork's stead. In fact, other flexible space and co-working companies such as Convene, Industrious, these are some of those upstarts that are trying to follow in WeWork's footsteps. They're really looking forward to an IPO from WeWork. It's going to provide a public market comparison to um, their businesses, and they're, they're very excited about it. Uh, you know, I think the biggest competitor tends to be large enterprises in-house real estate arms. So let's say you're Amazon or Google, like you might have your own team that looks for real estate and it looks for places for your companies to expand. WeWork hopes to supplant that. Well, Barry, we were chuckling a little bit about that on the commercial break when you walked in and you said that you're a REITs analyst, right? <laughs> I mean, you cover real estate companies. Has a valuation of a tech company, but on a fundamental level, we value this sometimes as a real estate story. Is this a real estate story more so than a tech story? I think at DA Davidson, we believe it leans more towards, towards the real estate story because their fundamentals is leasing office space at the end of the day. That's what they do. There's a large um, uh, technology component uh, that they bring to their space that is, is you know very unique you know Regis is in that space but they don't bring quite the technology uh, that a WeWorks um, brings and it WeWorks has you know most of their spaces are fairly well leased and uh, you know very positive comments from from the tenants that they have in there and also one third of their tenant base are Fortune 500 uh, companies that use it when they enter um, you know a new marketplace uh, especially especially internationally uh, fr from that standpoint. Instead of just taking down a, a, a large 10-year lease, it helps them kind of gain a foothold into that marketplace without having to spend a lot of money. Well, and we've been also t looking at other big tech IPOs this year, you know, Uber, Lyft. How much of a discount do you think the market places on this, given just the general broader volatility that we've been seeing, Barry? Despite maybe some of the good fundamentals that you're highlighting, at what point does this IPO come a little shaky? Just given how volatile the markets have been. Uh, Taylor, I think you're, you're you're spot on. This is not the market that uh, uh, Uber came uh, public in, and I think the the given the performance uh, that Uber has had has not kind of lived up to expectations. Um, that you know investors are going going to be uh, really scrutinizing big high profile. IPOs and their valuations and so we worked would fall uh, into that although the business model is very much different. Ellen when we talk about some of the business models here in terms of a runway for growth is it the U.S. story or is there a big international component as well that analysts are looking at? They've certainly been expanding overseas especially in Asia and I think they see a lot of growth opportunity overseas so I think they'll be pushing forth you know, a pretty strong international growth story. One thing that I look forward to seeing in the S1 is looking at the, uh, you know, the founder or CEO letter and trying to get a better sense from management how they want to spin their story toward investors. And I imagine a big part of that is going to be, hey, look at how quickly we're growing outside of the U.S. and how, how much growth opportunity we have there. This is something that you want to be a part of. Thank you. Wonderful roundtable to have. DA Davidson analyst Barry Oxford and Bloomberg Technologies. Ellen Hewitt, thank you for joining me as we await all things we work. And coming up, it's a rally for Roku. The streaming content company shares rise as much as 6% on the street high lift by Needham. A $150 price target will have the details next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen to us on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. Roku's price target was raised to a new street high view of $150. That's up from $120 at Needham, which touted the company's position within the streaming video market. Shares rose as much as 9%, extending in advance to a fourth straight day and reaching a new all-time high. To discuss, we're joined now by Mark Mahaney of RBC Capital in San Francisco. Mark, thank you so much for joining me. You know, I think my First consensus here is reading all the analyst notes on the street. Everyone seems pretty bullish on the stock. Where do you stand? 
Uh, well, let's see. Well, we are. Uh, this was a strong buy for us. If you want, earlier this year, we downgraded it uh, about a month ago, July 1st. And uh, given that the stock has moved up an additional 30% since our downgrade, our downgrade was clearly premature, or in other words, of saying uh, wrong. Look, this is uh, this company is no question, no question about it. It's it's a major beneficiary of the upcoming streaming wars. It is a launch partner with Disney for its Disney Plus service with Apple and probably with some other uh, companies, anything that leads to fragmentation of, view, of viewing away from uh, Netflix and leads to more ad supported content on the internet is a win for uh, Roku. There's also this play for them to move more into international markets, which has really been de minimis for them to date, but we think it's inevitable and I think it's likely near term that they'll expand into Europe. So there's the, 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 the winds are definitely tailwinds. They're definitely within this company's uh, sales. It's one of the best growth assets in, in mid small cap internet as far as I can tell. We're not buyers here because of valuation, but I'd love to see a pullback. I just don't have a great particular reason why it should pull back anytime soon. Well, Mark, you're always invited back because you called yourself on air, and we certainly do appreciate that. We won't call you wrong. We'll just call you early. How about that? Talk to me more, though, <laughs> ab about the valuation. You know, there have been a lot of concerns given, you know, a 30% run alone in the last eight days, I think 340% alone in the last year or so. What are sort of the concerns, you know, aside from valuation that you see on the fundamental level of this company? Well, I, I would I would say we think most of that move has been uh, very well warranted, and you know I don't know whether 13 times forward sales is is irrational and 12 times is perfect. I, you know that's that's a hard call to make, uh, and there's no question also that the fundamentals are about the best you can find in, uh, in mid small cap internet. We're talking about 80 percent year over year growth for their platform revenue, uh, not the not the device business, but the platform, the ad revenue business, with about 70 percent gross margins. You that's very rare air. You rarely see that uh, combination. Now, this company's a little bit on the smaller side, so that helps. Small size helps. But the issues, the challenges here are on the device side. There is a lot of competition from companies like uh, Amazon and Google. And then in terms of tapping into advertising dollars like there are a lot of these internet advertising behemoths and by the way step back the June quarter has been a phenomenally good quarter for internet advertising revenue every single major platform including Roku showed accelerating ad revenue growth I can't recall the last time that that happened so there's something going on I have a couple of theories as to what it is but there's something going on and Roku's fully participating in that but at some point you know the the size of the business will run into the fact that it is competing for ad dollars with the Google's and the Facebook's of the world and those are two pretty powerful platforms you know, Mark, if you want to come in my terminal here at GTV Go, I have a very interesting uh, chart showing Roku really versus Netflix because you talked about some of the competitors. Uh, you know, we know that Apple, you know, Amazon, all of these things, you know, I guess eventually could become competitors uh, to Roku, though year to date since really its IPO, it's just been a, a standout. Does Roku have any competitors really if you're an unowned content provider and you're releasing a streaming service there's nowhere to go but also to release it on Roku. Oh, there are some competitors. Nobody, nobody is uh, bereft of uh, competitors, but they are clearly in the catbird seat. I mean, they have positioned themselves for quite some time as the ad-supported uh, streaming platform. They're kind of a Switzerland in that world, and uh, and that's been a huge advantage for them. And now they are the leading um, uh, uh, streaming TV operating system in terms. That's so one third of all smart TVs you buy now. Their streaming uh, system is powered by Roku. That's a very good position to be in. They've surpassed Samsung in terms of their not their brand, but in terms of the, the number of TVs that have their streaming uh, uh, operating system embedded in there. So they have really well positioned themselves over the years. This isn't just over the last two quarters. So hats off to Roku. You know, uh, Mark, you also cover Netflix, and that's been a very interesting story. As we look out really 12 months from now, you're going to have a lot more competitors. You have Disney coming out, you know, a lot of other streaming competitors here. What's the biggest headwind for Netflix? Is it cost of spending on new content or keeping up slowing subscriber growth? What would be the biggest headwind for Netflix? Well, Taylor, I think you just uh, you think you just mentioned it. At least this is what's uh, the major investor obstacle right now. It's all of these new launches. November 12th, we have Disney Plus. 
uh, Apple streaming services, AT&T, Comcast. I mean, as far as I can tell, Pringles is going to launch a streaming service. I mean, everybody out there is going after this market. I mean, it's a big endorsement of the market opportunity that Netflix has been building against for a decade. So hats off to Netflix. But the concern near term is that the launch of all these services is going to steal away sub growth. And this came just a quarter after or half a quarter after Netflix just missed sub numbers. Uh, and there's also a question about what's happened to its pricing power, because one of the reasons that Netflix missed its numbers was that they had implemented a price increase and they got a little bit of pushback on that price increase. So that's all of the debate that's around Netflix. I mean, this is actually of all the FANG stocks, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, I'd argue that Netflix is the most contrarian, most out of consensus long call here, which is one of the reasons we like it. Uh, with the stock having pulled back in, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to get ahead of the curve here. I think that in the back half of the year, the content slate that's coming out of Netflix is the strongest it's ever going to have had. And my guess, that, my guess is that that's going to translate into its strongest sub-growth ever. If, that, if that's true, if those two things follow, I think the shares will be materially higher today uh, at the end of the year than they are now. Well, very interesting comments there, Mark. And one thing that you mentioned that perked my ears up was pricing power. I can join Hulu for $5.99. When are we going to see all of these companies just start offering free service for, let's say, $5 a month or so? I don't know that we will. Uh, there also is a problem here with that, with, with your idea, which is, um, this is a very expensive business, uh, you know, to get started in. Uh, you know, you're, uh, you're competing against Netflix, which is spending no, well north of $10 billion a year on ca uh, in cash out the door. It's actually closer to $15 billion on content, in addition to $4 billion on marketing. And they're still not free cash flow positive. What that tells you is it's a very difficult model, but it also tells you that this is a, a business where scale matters. And so whoever has the most subscribers can amortize content costs over the largest customer base. If Netflix can't make the economics of this business work nobody else can and uh, so I, I think the number of people who are going to come out with that five dollar offering is going to be very few and very far between I, I don't think I think it's a scale game if that premise is right Netflix has won whether there's a slowdown whether there are headwinds in the next 12 months that may well be the case but after that I think what will come out of it is uh, I and I don't think you're going to have 10 streaming uh, companies that win I don't think you'll have five streaming companies that win my guess is that you'll have three Netflix Disney and Amazon and other companies are going to try this lose a lot of money and go back to selling their content to Amazon uh, or maybe to Disney or to Netflix. Amazon, Disney, Netflix. Those are great, great bold calls. Thank you so much. Mark Mahaney of RBC Capital Thanks, Markets. Taylor. Appreciate it. And coming up with more of your personal data online, identity theft is on the rise. One Bloomberg reporter recounts his struggles with fraud and tells us what needs to change. That's next. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at technology. Be sure to follow our global breaking news network at TikTok on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. Six long years. That's the time it took Bloomberg's Drew Armstrong to get his good name and credit rating back after being scarred by identity theft. With more on how it happened, the startling statistics, and how he navigated the ordeal. It's Drew Armstrong. His essay is in the recent issue of this week's Bloomberg Business Week. Drew, walk me through what happened and why did it take so long to recover? Yeah, so this was an ordeal I went through starting back in 2013 when I got a call from a police department in Florida saying, you know, asking me if I lived in Florida. And I never had. I was living, um, I believe, in, uh, in Brooklyn at the time. And what had happened was a person had used a fake ID with my name and information on it and their photo and had gone from bank to bank in Florida opening up accounts. They then sold a fake RV to some people in Texas and wired the money back to Russia. Um, and I kind of thought that that would be the end of it, you know, mm -hmm. more or less that this was going to be a little bit of a pain, but kind of a local criminal matter. And what I didn't realize with this was that this was going to have ripples throughout my life for years and years to come. Um, it would destroy my credit rating entirely. It would make it impossible for me to get a loan, to get a new credit card, to get a mortgage. Um, it got me put on some kind of a list with the national security apparatus <laughs> where every time I would try to enter and leave the country, I would be pulled off the jetway or searched coming back through customs. And it took me years of dealing with 
with financial institutions to try and get this cleaned up. Um, it was very frustrating. It should be very, very scary for anybody, which is almost everybody who's right. at risk of this. Um, and it's also not clear to me that we've done a whole lot to change things. Well, it's funny. You're a healthcare reporter, but you're also now well versed in all companies yes. of cybersecurity and credit card companies and fact checking companies. And basically, I mean, what can be done? I mean, why aren't we seeing more companies double authenticating like on Gmail? You know, you get two identify yeah. uh, two authenticity identifications. Why aren't we seeing more of that where it matters? I want you to think about how easy it is to sign up for a credit card. If you've ever gone online and signed up for a new credit card, we make it really, really easy to get credit in mm -hmm. this country. Um, we basically require you to have a name, a date of birth, a social security number. And after that, you're pretty much good to go and find out whether or not you've been approved. Um, we don't then have a mechanism, you know, we talk about two-factor authentication. Like It is harder for me to sign up for my Gmail or log back on to Twitter a lot of times than it is in terms of someone sending something to my phone to say, is this really you? Um, we do not have a great system in this country in order to come back and verify that the financial transactions where we use our information that's personal to us but that can also be stolen, in fact, do represent us in terms of issuing those things. And that's a really, really big problem. We talk about the Equifax hack here and what a big deal that was. What was your experience about not only that, but then in your case with some of the credit bureaus and some of these, you know, online credit monitoring companies, how responsive were they? Uh, I would say about as responsive as you would expect them to be, which is not at all. Um, it yeah. is incredibly difficult to speak to a real person at a lot of these credit ratings, ratings agencies. And think about why. I mean, what is the purpose of a credit ratings agency? It is to say, we want to make sure that you are a potential um, loan holder in good standing, someone who is, can get credit. And we want to also make sure that if you have not paid your debts, other lenders know that. So they may purposely make it really, really hard for you to wipe things off their books. That is the reason they exist. They are there to help out lenders. Um, that also means, though, that when you have your identity stolen and your credit ruined and it wasn't your fault, mm. they make it really, really hard for you to go about undoing that. And that's a serious problem. We look at the Equifax hack, 147 million people in this country. That's almost everybody with a credit profile, is what we've been told, is affected by that. If anything, we probably don't have enough criminals to keep up with the vast supply of raw material that we have been giving them in these breaches. Uh, quickly, any chance to face your theft? The guy no, who stole I, from you. I, no, no, he um, he took a plea deal right before I was supposed <laughs> to go down to Miami and testify um, in his trial, uh, and so he went away to, to prison, um, and I mostly got my life back. Oh, what a nightmare! Thank you. That was Bloomberg's Drew Armstrong. Fascinating story. Catch it all in this week's edition of Bloomberg Business Week. And coming up, the tensions over in Hong Kong are reaching a new level. Protesters shut down the airport. We'll have the latest next. Fascinating photos from the airport and all of these protests in the last 72 hours reaching new levels of stress. We'll have more next. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Technology, I'm Taylor Riggs, in for Emily Chang. Now, Hong Kong airport authorities canceled all remaining flights on Monday after protesters swarmed the main terminal building for a fourth day. This is the biggest disruption yet in the city's economy since demonstrations began in early June. Bloomberg Markets Asia anchor Yvonne Mann filed this report from the airport. The Hong Kong International Airport slowly getting back to normal here. For the most part, we've seen protesters have called it a night. They've left some of the signage that's been plastered all over the airport walls here. But this was something we've never seen before, where we saw up to 4,000 demonstrators pack through the arrival halls, the departure halls upstairs, which ultimately led to multiple flights being canceled on Monday evening and afternoon. We're slowly seeing some of these flights come back online and set to take off uh, early Tuesday morning. But it still could be a bit of a hectic one, given the fact that we've seen airlines like China Eastern saying flights to Hong Kong could still be canceled on Tuesday. Uh, but 
we, what was interesting in this latest development was the police presence and the lack of it. There were no officers that showed up to disperse these crowds. They left at their own will. Perhaps police taking a little bit more of a cautious response after yet another violent weekend where we saw uh, several people injured as well. Both sides hardening their stance uh, in this recent escalation here and Beijing also ramping up the rhetoric and saying that these serious crimes are being committed by protesters and they're seeing signs of terrorism. All eyes now on Carrie Lam, the chief executive, as she meets with reporters Tuesday morning. In Hong Kong, I'm Yvonne Mann, Bloomberg. Well, and for more, I want to bring in Isaac Stonefish here with me in New York. He's a senior fellow at the Asia Society and in San Francisco, Bloomberg's global executive editor for technology, Tom Giles. So, Isaac, let me just start with you. I mean, fascinating photos that we saw on the ground. What changed for you in terms of investments, tech companies on the ground there in Hong Kong after the last sort of heightened tension in the last 72 hours? So people in Hong Kong are really upset at the way that both the Hong Kong government and the Beijing government has been responding. And I think what we can glean from what's happening is that this is not a short-term story. This is not something where investors can wake up on Wednesday and Thursday and everything in Hong Kong is back to normal and it's this oasis of stable investing. This is a long-term story. And even if the protesters do disband on their own accord and the streets are not as chaotic as they've been over the last several weeks, it's still going to be alive. Tom, you heard Isaac talk about how this is going to be a long-term story. From your coverage that you've been looking at overseas here and then back to your reporting in San Francisco, what are local tech companies on the ground starting to brace for as tensions ratchet up? Well, they're really looking at this, as, as Isaac pointed out, this is long term. This, we thought initially, uh, the signs pointed initially to this being something that was, it was in regard to a specific uh, piece of legislation that has since been shelved. But clearly this goes much, much deeper. And now that it's at the airport, it's really washing up on the rest of the world's shores. This is not something that's just confined to LegCo right there in Hong Kong. This is affecting flights in and out of Hong Kong. And so the protesters are sending a signal that they are looking to disrupt Hong Kong's role as a global financial center uh, and, and a gateway to China. Um, and they're sending a very, very strong, clear signal that they're digging in for the long term as are the Chinese authorities. Uh, something that didn't come up earlier uh, on the broadcast was the the pictures that we're seeing, the video images of what appears to be a massing of, of, of Chinese military in Shenzhen just over the border. Uh, those are not, those haven't been verified, but there's lots of images uh, and video clips making their way around Twitter that, that are also China sending a signal uh, seem to be sending a signal to the protesters that they mean business and they're, they are not going to walk away and let the protests continue. Isaac, if you're an investor in a company in Hong Kong, a technology company, a local startup, do you start to pull your money out? I think you start to play out what the political risk and what different scenarios could be moving forward. I think for so long, really since the massacre in Tiananmen Square in 1989, there's been this feeling that China and Hong Kong are safe harbors for investment and they're politically very stable places. At least that's been the public view. But I think what this is showing us and what some other tensions we're seeing in mainland China is showing us and the situation in, in Xinjiang with roughly one million Muslims in concentration camps are showing us is that Beijing and the PRC in Hong Kong are not necessarily politically stable polities. And it is certainly possible that some of the unrest we've seen in the Middle East over the last several decades could be the new normal for the situation in China and Hong Kong. Tom, we are mindful of the protests in Hong Kong and also aware that there is a m broader a global trade economic story underway as well between China and the U.S. As we turn to Asia and sort of look at the global trade story, we know that those September 1 deadlines are coming on that the president has tweeted about with additional tariffs. Within tech, what in those additional tariffs has you concerned the most? Anything that's going to, I mean, it's already showing up. 
across the tech sector. This has had big shock waves. Most recently in all of the companies that do business with Huawei, specifically being told you can no longer, you can no longer source uh, uh, your components to Huawei. There's been this process where that's gotten caught up. So it affects the chip makers. Um, there's big questions about whether uh, and to what extent tariffs are going to be slapped on Apple's devices. It's iPhones, etc. cetera. Um, you've had Foxconn come out and say this is Fo Foxconn is the is the manufacturer of a lot of Apple compo uh, Apple products on the mainland. You've had them say Apple has you know can shift shift its production outside of mainland China. But that kind of thing does not happen overnight. The tech industry is very concerned about how much further this trade war is going to go, how much it's going to affect demand, how much you're going to see Chinese uh, substitute their own, their own products, um, uh, smartphones, for example, uh, instead of the Apple devices. And you're starting to see it show up in Apple's results. You're starting to see all kinds of changes in terms of, you know, do venture capitalists want to go to China? You've seen a drop off in interest there in recent months. Um, it just, the, the ripple effect is, is, you know, it's going to deepen. Isaac, you heard Tom mention smartphones. So Huawei, where do they stand? I think Tom made some excellent points there. And I think one, possibility we have to consider is that in the medium to long term this could be good for Huawei this could provide a incentive for them to act uh, in a way that's smarter for their business moving forward it could really also I think more importantly provide them with added support domestically if Chinese consumers and the Chinese government decide to make Huawei the symbol for the rise of China and for China's proud global status could really see some very positive numbers for Huawei in terms of purchases and contracts domestically in China. Well, story that is not going away anytime soon. So thank you, Isaac Stonefish of the Asia Society and Bloomberg's Tom Giles. Thank you both. Coming up, voters in Argentina are voicing their anger about the economy at the ballot box, delivering a big blow to President Mauricio Macri. What it all means for the startup and VC community, that's next. And so far, it has flourished in Buenos Aires. We'll see what's on tap for those next. This is Bloomberg. Argentina saw a massive market sell-off Monday after a shocking primary election defeat for President Mauricio Macri. The peso sank as much as 30 percent to a record low against the dollar, while Argentina bonds and stocks plunged globally following the surprise results. Argentina's tech startup scene has managed to flourish in the face of the economy's financial crisis in the last year. But what the prognosis now is for the VC in the startup space, given the country's continued recession, and staggering inflation. Joining us via Skype to discuss this is FJ Labs co-founder Fabrice Grinda. FJ Labs is an early stage investment firm with a global focus. He also co-founded OLX, that's a global marketplace with operations in Argentina. So Fabrice, great to have you. So much of your investments have been centered in and around Argentina. So I just have to ask you, what changed for you today? What changes for these technology companies down there on the ground? I mean, the reality is if we've been, if you've been operating in Argentina for the last 20 years, you've kind of seen it all. You've had pesoification of your dollars, you've had uh, nationalization of your retirement assets, you've had cheating on the inflation statistics. And as a startup operator, you've basically had to deal with all of these things. And if anything, if you're already operating, the reality is most of the Argentine startups actually make all of their revenues in Brazil and the rest of the region more so than Argentina. If anything, when the peso devalue, devalues, it actually increases uh, their competitive advantage. And so if you're Mercado Libre, if you're Recarga, nothing really changed. If anything, you might actually be in a better position. The problem is more for the tech ecosystem and community in a go forward basis. Fewer startups are going to be created. Venture capitalists are going to be more wary of investing in the country given the uncertainty over Macri's reelection in October. That said, let's not overreact. I mean, the, this is a 
absolutely terrible news for the country. Uh, but these are still the primaries, and we'll see what happens in October. Right. Well, and do we know anything about the potentially new incoming government in October, assuming President Mauricio Macri loses that? What those new government policies could be around financial startups in the tech community? Do we have any details? They have been very succinct in details. I'd be very skeptical of whatever the promises they make, given uh, Christina Kirshner's uh, position as vice president. I mean, the concern, of course, is that she's uh, controlling and pulling the strings from behind the scenes, and she'll be de facto president. And her husband and her presidency has really been absolutely horrible for the country and for the tech community in the country, creating both an environment of uncertainty, cheating in the statistics and inflation. I mean, the I, I regardless of the reassurances they've been trying to make to the public markets today, I'd be skeptical of their claims give, just given their past history. Fabrice, if I'm looking at a country that defaulted on its obligations, do I have any more certainty that if I invest in a company there on the ground that I could get my money out? The current in the past, you've always found ways to to to, to deal with that. So you can actually structure around uh, around how the companies were, where the companies were owned, or where the parent company is, and where the quality is. So I'm I'm not too concerned that even if they reintroduce capital controls, which I hope they don't, uh, you can get money uh, out of your investment should you find a liquidity event. The issue is, will anyone want to buy a company uh, that is Argentine? Will will this prospects be there? And and so I I think just in general, the uncertainty of the Microeconomic environment is negative, but if a company sells, you can sell it. Well, wonderful. We'll continue to follow this. That was OLX co founder and FJ Labs co founder Fabrice Grinda joining us from Argentina. Now, to a story I want to continue to watch, it's all about Carl Icahn. He's reached an agreement with Cloudera that will see the activist investor awarded two seats on the technology company's board. The billionaire disclosed his position in the enterprise cloud software company earlier this month, arguing that it was undervalued. Icahn has been building his position slowly since, and roughly about 18.4% of the company as of last week. Joining us now to discuss is we're joined by Leanna Baker of the Bloomberg Deals team. Leanna, just give me the lowdown. Uh, what did Carl Icahn win today? So this was a really quick fight with mm -hmm. Carl Icahn, who's known to drag out fights and things can get pretty ugly, but this went down relatively quickly. He built up a position earlier this month, now owns a little under 20% of the company. And in this agreement, he cannot go higher than 20%. And uh, two of his associates will get a seat on the board. The board will be expanded by two directors. So what does he say? I mean, Carl Icahn says it's undervalued. Of course, when an activist comes in as a company, maybe you get a little nervous, but you want to hear them out. What specifically is undervalued to him? Because the fight happened so quickly, we never actually heard from Carl what his big plan was. He did say on TV before that he thought the merger with Hortonworks that Cloudera undertook last year didn't go so great. The stock's been down almost 50% in the past year. So he was a little critical, but nothing as bad as he said about you know Occidental. He's not taking the management to the cleaners or getting cute like that. So we, we, we don't really know what his plan was. Some of the analyst notes that I was reading about Cloudera, which is a, a cloud company basically, has been the future for the company could be one of an acquisition. So you have IBM acquiring Red Hat. Some analysts were saying that this makes very much more sense for IBM to come back in and look at Cloudera. What is the exit strategy for Cloudera? I spoke with the company earlier today, and they're not willing to say anything about M&A going forward, but one of Carl Icahn's directors will serve on the M&A committee for the company. That had been formed already, and the press release today did say that Cloudera was working with Morgan Stanley on the announcement today. So they do have a banker, but I can't say whether it would be a target, but it is of that size of software companies that do get taken out by bigger companies. But it's also a small valuation. Would it be wise to sell at this value? In the private markets a few years ago, Cloudera was a $4 billion company. Now it's under $2 billion. Who were the other investors? We talked so much about Carl Icahn. Who else is behind this company? A Czech investor uh, today put out a statement saying he supports 
Carl Icahn called Krupa, so that was one investor I'd never heard of them. But I think a lot of Cloudera investors are frustrated because the shares are down almost in half, so they're not getting a whole lot for their money right now. Well, and especially for a cloud computing company where all we hear is about how good the cloud is. Uh, any other exit strategies that we know if, let's say, IBM or Red Hat weren't invested, where else could they turn to? Cloudera has all the buzzwords. It has cloud in its name, as right. you mentioned. But from what I understand talking to experts, the focus of, that they have, it, it's been commoditized, it's services around the cloud, and they were forced to combine with their biggest competitor, Hortonworks, which was problematic. So um, we'll, we'll see what, what the future holds for them. They have some new products coming out later this summer. Okay, well, we'll keep an eye on those new products. Thank you so much. That was Bloomberg's Leanna Baker. Thank you for joining me. And coming up, Peter Thiel is at odds with the Trump administration, why he wants their hands off of encryption. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Conservative tech investor Peter Thiel is never shy about throwing his weight behind the Trump administration. But on Sunday, he found a topic where he broke with the U.S. government. If you de-encrypt everything, maybe, maybe stuff goes back uh, to, to our rivals in China. Maybe the FBI gets the information, maybe other people get it. I, I, I don't trust the FBI to keep it protected inside the FBI. Now contrast that top attorney general, William Barr, last month on the very same topic. I am suggesting that it is well past time for some in the tech community to abandon the posture that a technical solution is not worth exploring and instead turn their considerable talent to developing products that will reconcile good cybersecurity to the imperative of public safety and national security. Let's go to Washington and Bloomberg's Ben Brody for more. Ben, very complicated story, so I'm glad that you're here to break it down for us. First, sort of walk me through what Peter Thiel is talking about as it relates to encryption and then sort of what the FBI wants. Uh, right. So uh, Teal is basically saying that if you have these messages that are only visible uh, to sender and recipient, if you start putting in uh, what are called backdoors into those so that law enforcement uh, could get into those maybe with a warrant or, you know, maybe just to do a check, that that is going to uh, imperil privacy. Uh, it's going to make uh, bad actors are going to be able to get in through those backdoors as well, you know, whether that's uh, identity thieves or uh, people like that. And he's saying, you know, I want uh, strong encryption. I'm taking I'm taking the whole hawkish privacy line here, and I want to push back on this thing that uh, the Trump administration is doing, but we should say is sort of a longstanding tension between tech companies uh, and uh, the U.S. government going back at least into the Obama administration. Yeah, what are tech companies saying? I, I imagine companies like Facebook are pushing back pretty hard. Are they just claiming privacy rights? How much are they pushing back? Uh, that's right. Uh, this has been a simmering tension, and it's not something that they necessarily will get on the soapbox on and talk quite loudly about, not least of all because it's, it's hard to sort of take the other side of a debate uh, from, from law enforcement in this country. But it is something that they have regularly been talking to uh, enforcers and lawmakers about here in Washington uh, for the many uh, years past. And going back to what you said before, the FBI is now looking to do social media monitoring or to do more social media monitoring. Uh, uh, we believe that's of public post. It's not of encryption, uh, but it's the same kind of pressure that these companies are under to be uh, basically part of the solution when it comes to crimes that are happening that the federal government is investigating. Well, and what are the dangers of letting the U.S. government have this sort of, quote, backdoor in? Are the threat of bad actors a, a real issue? Uh, the threat of backed out, uh, bad actors do seem to be a real issue, at least when you talk uh, to the tech companies. You know, uh, identity thieves are going to get into their Chinese hackers are going to get into their Russian hackers, Iranian hackers. Uh, there are a lot of sophisticated bad actors, many of them with government support, uh, working all around the world to try and get uh, into people's one-on-one -on -one communications. There's also sort of the theoretical approach that, you know, could this chill free speech, could this chill political diversity? Uh, that's a little bit more for the university 
university uh, dorm room, uh, the university seminar hall. Uh, but I do think that there is a tension there. And the question is, can it be resolved while making both sides happy? I, I think it probably can't, but there may be compromises that can be made around the edges. Well, Ben, what I like about this story is it centers around the character that we know, which is Peter Thiel, who is lined up with the Trump administration and then has sometimes according to the Trump administration, has said the big tech is more left leaning. Where does this put Peter Thiel in the tension between big tech and Trump? Uh, you know, he has been sort of fanning these flames, particularly on Google. It's important to say that Peter Thiel is a board member of Facebook. So when it comes to the general tech clash, he's not going to go against uh, the company that he was uh, an early investor in and, and, you know, helps to lead. But he goes against Google, particularly for their ambitions uh, in China. He has called for the U.S. government, the FBI and the CIA to even be probing them over those things, as well as their developments of artificial uh, intelligence. So he is really doubling down on that. During that interview, he talked about the tension between uh, big tech and Senator McConnell last week. He said basically that conservatives never believe the tech companies because the tech companies, as you say, are filled with these liberal employees and we we have no reason to believe them. I, I think what's important here, though, is that Peter Thiel has the president's ear. He has advised uh, Donald Trump on technology issues. He regularly uh, speaks to him. And so these kinds of issues can hold weight, maybe not if he's going against the whole administration, but uh, but it's a view that the president, that the White House will take seriously. Well, thank you. That was Bloomberg's Ben Brody from Washington. Thanks for joining us. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. You can check us out at technology and be sure to follow our global breaking news network at TikTok on Twitter. This is Bloomberg.